Right, so I am joined with the Carl Hudson. Um, I feel like a lot of people know you within the actual SEO industry, but there's probably a lot of people that don't know you. For anyone that doesn't, what, who are you and what do you do? It's like a, um, it's like a Tinder pitch, this, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carl Hudson. Um, often, well, my friends often call us Hudson as opposed to Carl Hudson. That was because there was a lot of people called Carl in school. Um, being an SEO marketing since I was a, about 14 year old, 14, 15, all sort of started from the back of my dad, kind of pushing us that way. I was wanting to join the Royal Marines, but I found out I was colorblind. So usually me fashion sense and all that's absolute crap um, <laughs> due to colorblindness. That explains the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so then went down the route of getting involved in SEO, mainly to help parents out, which is obviously always nice. Um, and being involved in that game since, yeah, since I was very young. Got into um, online dating, sort of that was my main. Online dating and get rid of stretch marks was like my main thing at the time. Um, and not that I had stretch marks, I was still quite young. I was fat though, so that was maybe the thing. Um, <laughs> went into that, still pretty active in that industry today. Um, did pretty well in that industry, eventually led down the road to getting involved in gambling, uh, the gambling industry, which I believe this is where me and Kazra and Dooley and all that all kind of met. Um, <clears throat> successfully operated up to, I think it was about four, well, by the time I'm leaving the business now, it, it was about 46 online casinos we had. Um, we were dominating the UK space for, I think it was about six years, we dominate the UK space for online slots and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'm now moving on to agency stuff, um, running more and more of my own websites and partnerships with people. Um, and yeah, that's kind of my background. Yeah, so you, you, you covered quite a lot of things there, obviously. You, you started off when you were 14. Now, now you're what, 16, 17? <laughs> um, but if the hairline uh, says it, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you start you started off with like the dating stuff. You've done a lot of local, like small business SEO as well. And you've also done the gambling, the, the big boy stuff, as some people would call it. What's one thing that is different in, in all of these different industries? Because for example, some of the gambling guys, I see you speak to them and they're like, yeah, you just need so many links. You need so many content. Like what, what's one thing that's different in all of these industries? Would you I think? would say the main difference in all of the industries, it, the, the interesting part about getting involved in the gambling was it was a huge eye opener for me on, you know, what, what you can get away with, what actually applies, whether or not this different filter has been applied to gambling sites. Obviously, I would argue that is the case. You know, search engines aren't going to be applying their entire algorithm on um, carpet cleaners Manchester versus, say, online slots, where it's a national national term. Um, so, yeah, I think that element, but I would definitely say scale. Scale would be the main thing. So, you know, with your little local websites and things like that, you might be doing some citations, some content, and all of a sudden you're starting to see page one rankings with very little output on links. You know, it's just content structure, silo structure, website performing well, decent server, maybe it's an EMD domain. You, I'm pretty keen on EMDs. In a way, you go within, you know, a month, you page one, if not top of the SERP. Um, whereas with gambling, it was definitely more, I, I'm not saying we didn't do quick results. Like we had pretty quick results, especially on AMD domains. Like you're talking mm -hmm. within three months, we're ranking number one for our AMD keywords. Some of these keywords were like 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 searches a month. Um, but yeah, definitely scale and then just the spend. So like, you know, we, we were spending thousands and thousands on links, link building. We, we didn't necessarily have, we we cared a little bit about certain elements. So if we could get it niche relative, great chances on gambling. If you're going to buy a niche relevant link, they're going to charge you about $1,000. Um, so again, it's not one of them where we weren't particularly fussed as long as we were getting the links. And I kind of, I've adopted that approach when it comes to the local side as well. It's for me, a link's a link. It's kind of yeah. like, yes, you can apply different metrics, but it gets 
close to a point where you're applying too many metrics and then all that happens is is like you start procrastinating and actually you should just be building links yeah um, so what one thing that you touched upon and again <clears throat> i'm not i'm not certain what level of audience that we would be speaking to is emds what's an emd and why is it so beneficial so emd stands for exact match domain um usually it's based off search volume or search volume metrics usually within keyword planner within google obviously now that's you need to have an active ad adwords account to kind of get the accurate measure but there are third-party tools out there that you can kind of see that for instance ahrefs obviously that doesn't pull in from keyword planner but it pulls in from a uh, clickstream data and their own blended approach um so yeah you usually just exact match domain so exact match keyword and then you whatever your tld is so if it in the UK, typically it's .co.uk, .uk, um, or .org.uk, et cetera, whereas in uh, national, it'd be like .com, .org, uh, .org .net. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then um, another interesting take that you said, and there's probably going to be some people that will hate you for this, there'll, <laughs> there'll be some people that will love you, is link procrastination, which I feel like is massive in the SEO industry. Um, to you, to you, like we probably have very similar opinions on this, but to you, what's the perfect type of link? And is there a perfect type of link as well? The perfect type of link. So in my eyes, the perfect type of link would be a link that has a decent amount of RDs going to it or a domain that has a decent amount of RDs going to it and then internally links through to the page that I'm getting the link from. And then on that page, there's just a smaller amount of OBL, so outbound links. And that, to me, that's what you want. And like all these made up metrics, Ahrefs, SEMrush, Moz, Majestic, like at the end of the day, they're all trying to guess what the algorithm dictates. But there has never been a Google patent that stipulates um, page authority is a metric that they rely on. There's never been a... Um, Google patent that says domain authority is a metric that they rely on to gauge the trustworthiness of a link. You know, it's... Or yes, relevance as well. Exactly. There was a page rank one, which has since expired, it, but I would still argue is, you know, it's quite part of it. But again, the page rank metric was all based off RDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, nothing else. I, I, think, I think the biggest thing that people are scared of when it comes to link building and it, it, it's probably more so fear as opposed to is it the right type of link is that they're probably it might be a big investment for some people um and when they are trying to get the, the perfect type of link they want the biggest bang for their buck what would you say at the minute's working very well from a link building approach if you are on let's say a tighter budget where you can apply to any website so I'm quite a big advocate for a lot of people rave on about niche edits. Um, I'm actually more of an advocate and especially in the gambling industry, we built a hell of a lot more um, guest posts than we did niche edits. And um, the reason for that is <clears throat> you can typically dictate to the websites that you're getting the guest post on to internally link. Now, mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, you can pick out some of their best performing pages and get an internal link from those pages to your pages. Um, and they're, they're quite happy to do that because it's just seen as an internal link. Especially in the trickier niches, it's quite difficult to um, A, get a post in some of these niches, but then B, th they can sometimes be a bit off if you're trying to internally link to like a gambling post, for instance, or a gambling site. Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely guest posts are a must, I would say. Um, you can ge generally get them, you know, they're not super expensive. You see quite a quick return on investment. I, I personally think on a guest post within, I know within Searchroo, which is one of our agencies, um, you know, customers are often on like the link pack one, link pack two and seeing great results and coming back and then eventually building up. Um, so yeah. So one thing that I want to look back round to, and it's probably going to move away from the link building talk because I don't want to bore everyone about it, <laughs> is um, the Searcheroo side. Because obviously you've been the founder of Searcheroo 
Um, not many people know that. There was obviously that one guy in Chiang Mai that said, oh, you, you work for Kaz, and it's not, it's not the case, right? <laughs> we're, we're, we're both directors. You were the actual founder. Um, but why? Wh when, did, when did you find Search Room? What was the reasoning behind it? So we initially set up, so, so me and Tom Phillips going back, I think it was 2018, um, yeah. we were chatting a lot um, and obviously we both have our own outreach teams and things like this and it kind of got to a point where it's like, well, we're there, we've got a lot of knowledge in in link building. Um, why don't we set up a agency that would start to build our own assets and then on the sideline of that, um, we can pay the salaries leveraging the link building selling or content selling. And that's kind of what we did. And that was, yeah, up till 2021, I believe, um, Tom exited the business, went on to focus on some of his own assets, which are skyrocketing, doing great. Um, and then Dooley and yourself uh, and Scott, Scott's often like an undermentioned guy, but Scott's yeah. quite vital as well. Um, came into the business and yeah, trying to help leverage and grow it even more. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why Search Room was set up in the first place. I would say we're, we're, we've slided a little bit from focus on our own assets a little bit at the minute and trying mm -hmm. to build the, the agency side a little bit more. Um, and that's probably, you know, one of the goals of 2024 is actually build the agency side. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So what, what does the team look like? Because um, I, I know that there will be some agency owners out there and they probably will want to know a little bit more of the structure of the, the team. Um, so what, what's that looking like? So we've got a range of different roles. We have, so on the content side, I believe we have, it might be, I don't quote us on exact numbers. Um, often Charlotte manages all of this and all the teams. So I'm probably going to mess things up. Um, <laughs> but we'll go with it. We'll see. Um, so writing team is, I, I believe, around nine writers. Um, I would say 80% of them are UK-based and UK graduates from uh, university. We then have two proofreaders who basically our process there is they submit the content, proofreaders audit it, make sure, send it back, you know, a bit back and forth if they're not happy, especially if the, cust uh, the customers submit the brief, they make sure that, they've stuck to the brief. Um, then on the link building side, I believe we've got a team of five in outreach, um, three in customer sort of management, and then two in database care. Um, so by, you know, customer management, they deal with all the orders and they're all yeah. trained up. Most of them are all trained up on at least some level of knowledge of SEO. And um, the customer managers tend to have a lot higher level um the link builders know about links and then the database managers tend to just you know be cleaning up the database checking out the contacts contacts and then obviously updating metrics and things like this um yeah yeah so <clears throat> one thing that always stuck out to me whenever i spoke to you even prior to like investing into search and stuff like that is that you are very systems driven and you also like to build an army around you. Because like right now, I just asked you, like, how many staff have you got? And you're like, I don't know, maybe th th this amount. But um, even even in the gambling days as well, like I remember you, you had like you had a very big team. And I think more so than ever, it's all about like building a good team um, and being able to deliver things on time, but also maintain quality as well. Yeah. But how how did you learn about outsourcing? Because I feel like, again, a lot of people watching this podcast would probably struggle with outsourcing or knowing when to outsource certain things and stuff. So obviously you're going back way, way back when, when it kind of all started. Um, I start, I think I got my first VA, so virtual assistant, when I was about 18, 19 year old. Um, <clears throat> what so, were they doing? Going back about two years ago there. <laughs> no one knows that I'm actually, thir I'm 32. We're going back quite a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were kind of in the hardest part of that, but I was getting megally frustrated and I imagine a lot of people will because you often hire a VA and, you know, they say, they give you the golden resume. It's all, they know everything, right? 
And then you give them a task and what you get back is, <laughs> is not what you expected to get back. Now, what then started to happen was, was, right, I need to come up with a way step by step. Because let's face it, sometimes you're hiring in countries, uh, different countries, and you're leveraging the different um, costs and labor, obviously. So like the, the Philippines is a great example of this, where, you know, the average salary might be, you know, eight, 800 to a thousand dollars for a very high skilled VA. Um, but you need to create a process and a system for them to follow more to, to create something that you would sign off on. So this is what a lot of people will get wrong is they ask their VA to go away and do keyword research, but they've never gave them a step-by-step -step process on how to do keyword research the way they want to do keyword research. Um, so then they often get back this document, which is, by all means, keyword research, but you're like, well, I don't know what to do with this. Like, it's going to take me longer to work out how you've got to where you've got than if I just give you a process in the first place to follow, and then you're kind of repeating what I do. And then it's a case of what I always try to do is, so within Searcher, we use Trello, and there's like a Trello um, training board, which has loads of videos and things that as soon as someone joins, they have to run through the videos, any questions, we try to then add into like an update card. So within the cards, so it's kind of answering questions they might have. Um, and then off the back of that, once they're then in the role, if they find something great and it seems to speed up the process, improve the process or improve like an aspect of it, we often have them film it so I can see. And then if it is good, we then put that in the, the process for them to learn. So then the new guys coming in down the line have the most up to date SOP. Um, and that's kind of the route. Like the hardest part of what I'm in, I've been stumbling a bit with this recently is managing top level what goes on and making right. sure all of the plates are spinning. That's probably the hardest part. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. Um, what, one, one thing that you said is essentially like your VAs are as good as your SOPs. I remember many, many years ago, we uh, we, ha we we had just hired this this VA, and it was it was a very or I thought it was very simple. So did the team. But we outsourced this. I think it might have been like how to submit a citation or so, something along those lines, right? So they were filling out this form, right? And they came back to us like six hours later, They're like is your SOP is not working. And they basically filled out the entire form and there was a big massive green submit button <laughs> and you didn't click it. And you're like, it's because you need to click the submit button. Mm -hmm. That's why it's not working. And it's like, well, do you blame them or do you blame the SOP? Because they didn't say the <laughs> SOP. Yeah. So, well, yeah, kind I'm, of I'm, them where it's like you have to dumb it down. So, I don't know, like a, a seven-year-old could do it. So, like, there's no get, like, do not, do not assume the next step, mm. like don't make them logical connections that oh, they'll just they'll press yes, right? And yes. I've had that so many times as well. Yeah, it's definitely. So what about you is. guys? Because I know, obviously, aside from the search through side, obviously you run a lot of um, rank and rents and things. How how would you say your systems and processes are developing over the years? So one thing that has become very apparent is that me and James are really bad at doing SOPs. So we'll just essentially teach somebody, whether it's Elliot or Lucy in the office, and their job is while we're doing the actual SOP is they're just writing it down. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a very, very smoother process. I've tried to do SOPs. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm probably very much like you where I'm like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's apparent you need to press the submit mm -hmm. button and do this and that now and that, but it's not. It's interesting. Don't get me wrong. Like, I would say I'm pretty good at systemizing, but the way I systemize is generally I'll put it into a Loom video of me doing it and then say, yeah. watch the Loom video. And then almost have like a document which highlights the Loom video and what the processes are. And it's kind of like what you've just said there. You're quite good at doing the task, but actually the systemization should be left to a systems guy. But that's, it's fantastic that like you've actually, between the pay is like, 
gain that understanding that actually we're not the greatest at this. Let's yeah. get someone who is good at it to do it. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I think that that was probably our biggest stumbling block a few years ago where like you should have seen the like I, I've said this before. I'm the only web developer that you'll speak to that hasn't built a website in the past five years. Right. Because Elliot in the office or somebody in the office has built it. Right. But I remember setting up that SOP like four years ago, whenever it was three, four years ago. And then um, it was like a, a Loom video and maybe 400 step SOP from start to finish on how to host the website, how to register the domain, how to upload the content. And then I remember like six months go by and Elliot's like in this SOP, he's like deleted like 300 steps. That he's put it down to like 200 steps. I'm like, why have you done that? You've just deleted half my SOP. He's like, yeah, I've just made it better. I'm like, ah, right, okay, that, that, so, yeah, you have made it better. I looked at it, and I'm like, yeah, that's a lot smoother. Just, just do that, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's, he, like, literally, we'll, we'll do the Loom video, and then somebody in the office will actually document it down, whether it's Dan, mm -hmm. Elliot, or Lucy. Um, and it, we, we feel that it's a lot smoother process because, again, nobody, or I, I personally don't enjoy writing a 700-step SOP on how to build a, I don't know, website. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um so what what what's some of your goals obviously we're going into 2024 um what's some of your personal goals business goals do you want to invest in more businesses obviously again i, I don't think many people know this about you but we, you are one of the actual investors into auto blogging as well um so yeah Aside from Sertru, is there anything else that you're doing? What's your business goals? What's your personal goals for 2024? I think, obviously, aside from Sertru, grow it. I've already said that's the idea um, over the next few months um, to try really hone in on that. Um, personal goals, I've got, I'm getting married in, um, oh God, July. <laughs> I thought I forgot there. It's like, oh no, 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 don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, get married in July so one of the keys this year I've been listening to a lot of um, biohacking stuff and I, I think you already know I'm quite into the biohacking space have been for a few years but I'm trying to refine my knowledge a little bit more on it um, and focusing more on health and you know there was a point where I went down the fitness route now fitness isn't always the greatest thing so like i went into bodybuilding went on stage because i went from quite a big guy down to you know six pack abs and all this went on stage just to say i could do it um it's like a goal and you're not healthy no oh, you're not healthy at all stan you you feel the the day on stage is the shittest day of your life because you feel depleted you've dehydrated to hell and yeah you just it's crap so this year I'm focusing especially, well, for the whole year, but obviously there's going to be a point where I'm probably going to have to dial off a bit during the wedding and honeymoon. Um, focusing on health in that side and making sure, you know, inflammation factors, heart health, cardiovascular health, hitting all the boxes. Yeah. In terms of business health, uh, well, business health as well, let's go down that route, why not? Um, I want to have a few more websites of our own um, between me and my partner. Um, yeah. I want to build some of our own local assets as well a little bit more. Um, I then also want to dial down and knuckle down a little bit more on our existing businesses because I think there's some great opportunities there that just aren't really getting the time spent on them or top-level management overview to just guide them properly in the right direction. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at doing. We, we've been going quite heavy into the Corey method. Um, anyone who doesn't know Corey is an absolute legend, very technical. Um, very probably have about 12, 12 cups of coffee if you're going to try and listen to one of his talks. <laughs> and maybe it's an Adderall just to keep you going. Um, not recommending drugs at all. Obviously, <laughs> disclaimer right there, medical yeah. disclaimer. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, oh. so I always love describing Corey as the guy that knows every single Google patent because I'm I'm fairly certain he does. Like the Google <laughs> patent <laughs> library. Definitely. So there's so many times like you chat to him and he just pulls up a patent. And you're like, oh my god. But like, 
it's fantastic to see, but again, like we're, we're quite big advocates on, you know, like the core room efforts, fantastic, and there's definitely elements of it that we're going to be implementing. So, you know, like topical maps, briefs for each of your pages that you're doing, and like how you lay out those briefs and things. You know, we're, we're focusing more on doing all of those sort of things. And um, but then there's also elements that I almost feel are just a little bit too one sided and. At the end of the day, there's there's plenty of ways to win in the SERPs. Otherwise, all that would happen is all you see is core style content and the SERPs are going to get very do, do you know what? Right? It's interesting you say that because there's, there's never just a, a one-size-fits-all. Like, for example, how many times have you been asked um, how many informational to monetizational posts do I need, right? And then it's like, well, it depends because if you're an e-commerce brand, 99% of your pages are going to be monet uh, monetizational. But if, say, for example, you're more of a how-to guide website, then probably the other way. It's, it's the other way. But then you've also got, for example, the likes of Pornhub or YouTube, right? Every single one of their pages have videos on it. So it's uh, like... How did you just go from Pornhub to YouTube? What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, ju I'm, ju I'm just trying to throw a spanner in the works. But <laughs> you, 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 you get what I mean where it's like, mm -hmm. it just solely depends on, first of all, the niche. Then it depends on the actual type of website you're going for. Then it depends on, is it an e-commerce? Is it a brand? Is it a news-related website that you're trying to, trying to rank? So... There, there, there isn't just a one size fits all when it comes to SEO. And I think that that's where a lot of people go wrong and they just sometimes have the blinkers on. They're like, right, I need 60% informational and 40% monetizational because I read it on a, <laughs> on a blog somewhere and it's like, well. Well, it's kind of like probably. a funny story with our um, golden anchor text ratio. That, there's no real such thing. If you read the like the ebook that we have, I think it's is it a twenty page or something? I can't remember. We'll have the link in the in the description. Um, the you know it often tells you you have to do the research. You have to map out what anchor texts are golden within your niche. But then at the end it says here's the golden ratio, and it kind of just has a kind of blend between them all because some people just want to work off a certain ratio and they don't care about the niche. Yeah, um, yeah. which isn't obviously the best that I would never advise that obviously always do your competitor research and analysis. Um, but again, just because you're copying a competitor doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to outrank them. Um, you need new stuff to the table. Otherwise, why would Google choose to rank your site above a competitor who's already been there, got the historic history, etc. cetera. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. So what about yourself? What, what, what before before you move on, I just I was aware you're about to move on there. What about yourself? Business goals, aspirations, um, business goals. So I want to do more talks outside of the SEO world. I feel like that a lot a lot obviously a lot of people know me for the stuff that I do with like yourself, like Sarcheru. Um, I do a lot of stuff with James and the team. Um, so a lot of people know me for that, but I want to kind of step outside of that and because. Obviously, I've got my own investments. I've got auto blogging, search through, I've invested in a manufacturing company. So there's a lot of digital marketing conferences that I want to essentially speak at and not just solely home in on SEO. Because again, like I've run a Facebook ads agency. Um, I've got the ranking rent stuff. I've got the affiliate stuff. I've got the agency. Um, there's a lot more to this than just SEO. And I feel like SEOs just always want to speak to other SEOs. So I want to step out of the, of the SEO industry and kind of just go into other uh, other areas um and then <clears throat> from a from the affiliate sites i kind of want to exit one because i've never really exited um anything yet and i feel like i just want to know what what the poll process is like obviously gary um sold get me links and he's, he, he says that there was like a two year earn out that he had to do and you can't enter that space again. So I kind of want to see what that's like. Um, and then health goals, more, more, more so personal goals and health. I kind of want to smash out the gym. Obviously, throughout the entirety of 2023, I wasn't sick once. And now <laughs> first week of January in 2024, I'm, I'm, I'm ill, literally been bed bound for like two days now. Um, but from a fitness point of view, I want to 
continue going to the gym in 2023 i think i missed the gym for like three weeks total and that was because i was traveling and stuff like that every other day i went and um, so i want i still want to continue doing that in 2024 um i've also got like some weight goals so i want to hit 70 kilograms by the end of the year i'm right now 62 63 so I, so we I often should... laugh about this so that, that's what i would say the weight that i was when i was about five Five or six. <laughs> Listen, not not all of us are overweight, so <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, you you should surely have some weight goals as well for the wedding, no? Do you not want to? No, uh, uh, I don't really. I, once you've been doing it for quite a while, you begin to realise that weight's not really the goal. I want to look good. I right. probably have like you know vascularity in the arms and stuff like that flat belly i'm not really bothered about the six but if i can get it happy days but if i have to get it with sacrifice <laughs> yeah. i reckon i reckon i could pull up messages of us oh, two speaking during covid and you're like yeah i'm gonna get abs this year i've never seen you once have abs in person i've obviously seen the photos and stuff but i've ne never once seen you in person have abs the annoying thing is you know ai's came out and it's revealed all the secrets <laughs> that's the problem there was never ever abs. Never went on stage. No, nope. <laughs> only I. Artificially um, um, But that like absolutely killed us. So yeah, if I can get there, like there's a lot in the biohacker niche, which is what I'm delving more and more into. And mm -hmm. you know, often it's mentioning like supplementation could be a route to getting the abs because actually you could be more prone um, if your thyroid's not as active to holding fat around your midsection. In right. that, which is something I've always struggled with, to be fair. Even when I was, it absolutely killed me getting my abs in. Like, just getting the weight off the my arms, everything was so lean. Just the midsection would not fucking budge. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's all sort of stuff. See, I, I I was weirdly looking at photos of myself from like a few months ago when I was just about fifty nine, sixty kg, and my abs were like clear as day. You could see them. Now I'm like 62, 63, and I'm like, oh no, I can lift heavier, but my abs are gone. I'm like, what's happened here? So um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's always a, a fine balance. I feel like when you're trying to obviously gain weight to lift heavier, but you're also trying to maintain abs. So I don't know. I'm sure I'm sure I'll find the perfect recipe this year. Um, and then aside from that as well, I want I want to do more investments. Um, there's there's one currently in, in in the works um that we're working on in the igb space so hopefully hopefully by february that that'll be finished and um yeah so one thing that i want to touch upon because you're doing a few talks um this year um what's made you do them and are you sh or actually first of all are you stressed about them are you nervous i'm not particularly nervous so we're not doing talks in the sense of we're not going up on stage and presenting, um, you know, a PowerPoint presentation type thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not particularly nervous because I've been in the game so long. There's not many questions that I can be asked where I'd be like, oh, I don't have an answer for this. Yeah. And if I didn't have an answer, I'd just say, sorry, I don't have an answer for this. I'll, I'll find out for you, though, type thing. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm not particularly stressed about them. The main thing I'm stressed about is I've never, ever, uh, I just quite like being sat behind a screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I quite like sitting and just doing the work. So obviously going up on stage and talking in front of people, it's not necessarily, I'm definitely not a confident. At the end of the day, I've been half naked in front of an audience <laughs> of 300 people. Um, like it's not a confidence thing at all. Um, it's just haven't done it in a, mm. I've, I've done it before very, very long time ago when I, I was about 18 and set up a little, um, agency, um, like an SEO agency type thing. And, you know, it went through doing that. I think that they're called the BMI groups or something business, something. I can't remember what they're called, but basically a little business meetup group and, yeah, there was different talks that they would have and they would often ask me to get up and do a talk in front of like 50 people or whatever. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's just, yeah, it'll be interesting. So what's made me to step into the limelight a little bit more? We're now in the world of AI 
And I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure, you know, this year is going to be everything AI mad. We'll probably be, by the end of the year, up to GPT-5, GPT-6, yeah. uh, open AI, sorry. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's becoming more and more important to have a personal brand. And, you know, people seeing an actual person then that, you know, there's authenticity behind that. So like YouTube channels, videos, people can very quickly, you know, for instance, you Kaz, in the last year, you've been really stepping up your game on that front. You know, you go on to YouTube, you type in Kazra Dash, bam, straight away, you type Kazra, probably Kazra SEO, you know, you're coming up. Um, so that th- those sort of elements are going to be, in my opinion, fundamental moving forward for anything, especially agency wise, where people are looking, you know, they might come, to say search through and they go, <clears throat> let's do a little bit of research into the directors, what do they own, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or from even, and if obviously going back to, you know, your standard punters, e-commerce brands, um, affiliate brands, you know, what are the, the backgrounds of the people that are running the brands? And that's, I, I think, going to become fundamental in the future is, you know, knowing that there's actually people behind the brands yeah. Um, and I think that will become a factor for Google's rank and algorithm if it isn't already. So branded search, because you often see, you know, these big brands dominate in search. And my wonder is, is it because people are actually typing in the brand name, clicking on the actual brand, and all of a sudden it's aligning and saying, oh, these are clearly quite searched for? Yeah, definitely. I, f- I feel like... Um... I feel like the, the reasons why you've just said, like, oh, this is why I want to get into building your own personal brand is the exact same reasons as to why James is trying to do it. Just trying to be not just a, a face behind the keyboard, but actually being a face up on stage or doing podcasts and stuff like that as well, which is it, it's, it's, it's really good to see, to be fair. Um, what, where, where are you speaking? Like, what conferences? Can you say? Um, the, yeah, there's a conference in Poland, I believe, in March. Um, yeah, yeah. There's potentially, I have to speak to Mads on it, but there's a potential Q&A, so just a Q&A slot. There's a potential Q&A slot in Saigon, potentially, in April. Um, and then I believe there's a Turkish um, Corey's conference sometime in September. Right. And I believe we're on about doing like a Q&A style thing for, um, and I think that's it for this year, obviously. I can't be doing too many of them because I kind of want to try and grow some of our own. And there's a lot of traveling this year, obviously wedding, um, stag do's, um, the, the traveling in between, um, and then honeymoon. So I can't be traveling too much because I actually have to sit and do some work at the keyboard. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where where are you going for your honeymoon? Have you decided? We've actually just decided. To be fair, you've just reminded us. I need to book some flights because I've got a voucher that I've been meaning to use for about six months, and it's like a two grand voucher, and that's going to go soon if I don't book it. <laughs> um, we're going to Australia and Bali. Right. So I think we said two weeks Australia, like the Gold Coast and up, because last time we went, we kind of went everywhere, and it, just not enough time. Um, gold coast and up, and then a week in Bali. But I'll probably be taking the laptop, no doubt. We'll probably have a week off at some point. Yeah, so some somebody somebody has to run the ship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So aside from like the talks and stuff like that, are you, are you trying to actively do more podcasts to build to build your personal brand? Um, yeah, so I'm going to start. Obviously, I'm quite well known within the SEO community of like the more high le- high end SEOs. So it'd be quite interesting to reach out to them and sort of, you know, talk a little bit more about me experience in the gambling industry um, or affiliate marketing experience, you know, a little bit of e-commerce background um, and going down that route. I'll definitely be trying to do more on YouTube. I know you have some mad goal um yeah. youtube this year um what was it two videos a day or something your, your plan is 
you're not meant to tell that one out to people. <laughs> um, yeah. No, no, I'm making you accountable, son. <laughs> so there will be at some point two videos a day going out on my channel. Um, I just need to record a load of courses. So this is another one of the, the personal goals. Um, I feel like you, you put me on the spot when you asked me that. <laughs> so basically, when currently I'm uploading like more of a AI SEO video or like a website review video or like how to do internal links or whatever else, right? So like more of a guide. Then the second video that would be uploaded would be like more of a course. So the second video, for example, I might do four courses throughout the year. First course might be to do with like e-commerce SEO, how to get more traffic to your website. Then that might be like, let's say 18, 25 videos. So I'll have 25 videos going out for 25 days, two videos a day. And then what I'm planning on doing is like, for example, a local SEO um, course or maybe like a link building course and then uploading those as well as the second video of the day. Um, but yeah, that's that that's the goal for YouTube. Um, it's not going to be easy, but um, yeah, it's, it, to be fair, the, the YouTube channel's grown. It's, it's, there is no secret. Like somebody asked me this um, over on Instagram when I hit 2,000 subscribers less than 90 days they said oh what, what's what's your secret and i'm like there's no secret just be consistent be consistent and be good um obviously it's, that kind of aspect kind of applies in life though right because if you think your fitness goals uh yeah if you're doing weight loss or even weight gain like you have to be c consistency is key it's mm -hmm. never you're never going to get there in one day that like, yes there's overnight successes but no one looks at the 10 years that they've spent getting to that success yeah, I, I remember when I first joined or when I first started consistently going to the gym, which was like maybe like a year and a bit ago, I said, I'm going to get a six pack in 12 weeks. That wasn't the case. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 took, it took me like a year and a bit to get a six pack, like a year and like a, uh, a year and three months to, 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 for, for me to actually be able to see it. And I'm like, I can't believe I thought I'd be able to get it in 12 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, 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 feel, I feel like consistency is key. Um, same goes with like the Twitter. I've I done, I done really good numbers on Twitter as well last year. Went from like 500 followers to like 5,000, just over 5,000. And again, like I was doing case studies, I was doing um, threads, I was doing tweets, I was replying to people. And all it is is just consistently just going and on and saying... Is that you consistently replying as well? So you haven't got like a VA? Because I know some yeah, so influencers have VAs who reply and things. I'll tell you a funny story about this. Um, so I tried outsourcing my LinkedIn to a VA, right? And I was like, oh, this is going to be brilliant. I'm not going to need to do any work on it. And they came back with like a case study. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is this is brilliant. Like... This is what I think I'd given them like 12 case studies from search Roo clients or from consultancy clients that I'd done. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is really good. They had literally just word for word copied somebody else's case study. And I'm like, well, I can't even use this now. So <laughs> I, was, I literally had to let, let them go. And I'm like, you, you can't just copy somebody else's case study. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's uh, that's why I will never outsource any of my social media because I don't want any low quality content going up there, especially if it is copied from somebody else. Like that's that's when you get in a lot of um, drama, and yeah. So how do so, you go about then? Because I use social media, but I tend to try to just use it for work purposes. I in the groups, you know, if I've got an issue with something, I'll try and research it in a group and or put a post out to find someone to work with to fix. How do you manage your time for the responses? Are you using any software for that? Are you just manually on your phone getting a notification or oh, I've got to reply to them? So I have time limits on my phone. Um, so like I can only use Facebook, Instagram, <coughs> Twitter, and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. What's the fourth one? Facebook, Instagram. TikTok. TikTok. Um, only for one hour. And that's across all of them, right? So... I well, just like make combined? yeah yeah combined so oh, wow. I, I make certain that if i am on my phone i'm trying to be as productive as possible because at the back of my head i'm like that timer is going down so if i don't reply to so and so um like it's i'll need to wait until tomorrow but the thing is what i've personally found is if you're on your phone scrolling 
you're just getting dopamine hits, right? Because you're just scrolling, watching videos, whatever else, liking crazy dog videos and other other stuff. If I'm on my actual computer, I'm actually more honed in on like actually doing work and be, like output, outputting something productive. So I try to always just use social media on my computer as opposed to on my phone because otherwise I'll just get distracted. You're getting know. lost in TikTok or something, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you've went on holiday. I'm like, oh, let's let's wind Carl up or let's wind Dooley up. So I, I try to... <laughs> I try to not use it on my phone as much as I can. Um, obviously, I've got it installed and stuff, but yeah, that that's probably the hardest part. But then the the, the other thing as well is um, I try to bes- like create a bespoke um, feed. So I don't know if, if you've obviously heard of this, but say, for example, if you're on Instagram and you're consistently viewing cat videos, right, it's going to recommend you more cat videos. But say, for example, if you're on Instagram and you are looking at fitness, like, I don't know, seven ways to grow your chest in the gym, like, I don't know, bicep workouts, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to essentially recommend you more fitness related um, videos. So I always try to go down that route as opposed to, I don't know, watching a cat video there, watching a car video here. So it's all it's all bespoke to what I want. So even when I, when I am on it, it's a little bit more helping me out whether it is in the gym or whether it's business um advice that is recommending me and stuff like that so i always try to do that um and yeah just try and spend as much time um or sorry try and spend as less amount of time just randomly scrolling because i feel like that a lot of people have attention span issues where they're if you, if you don't keep their attention span they're gone this is one of the reasons why I just tend to try to stay off it because my attention span, I know what I'm like, I'll easily get distracted. So all of a sudden mm. I've been watching, you know, half an hour bloody dog videos or something. Or <laughs> So I try to just like in the morning, I'll watch a podcast. Um, sometimes because I've got like a two screen set up. Um, sometimes I will have like a little podcast running just so it's like background noise uh, yeah. when working. But I try to, I, I don't really don't really do TikTok. Um, I don't really do any of the feeds like uh, Facebook stories and stuff. I just, I don't have, like, I don't have the, I just know I'd get too distracted from your working day. So it's quite cool that you've got like filters in place and like the time limits that would make you stay focused. Yeah. They, they, so like the reason why I, why I done it and the reason why I have like a bespoke feed to what I like is um, the whole theory that you, you've probably heard this. You're, you're the average sum of the five people that are your closest to or the four people that you're closest to. And I think that a sub branch of that is say, for example, you're getting recommended Alex Hormozzi videos or Tate videos or whatever else. You're going to pick up subconsciously some of the things that they say. So if Alex Hormozzi is calling you lazy because you've not got out and been to the gym, you're probably going to subconsciously think the next time you're going to miss a gym day, you're going to be like, oh, I probably shouldn't miss a gym day. So that that's that's the whole thought process as to why I've done it. And I feel like it works pretty well, but each each their own, really. Um, so, yeah, we're, so I feel like we could speak for for an extra three hours, but where can people find you? Um, what was that, sorry? Where, where can people find you? Um, oh, me Twitter. All right, that's Carl Hood SEO. Try getting Carl Hudson, but yep, couldn't get that. Um, and then, yeah, just, you know, search through, reach out via search through. I'm sure you'll be able to get in touch. Um, you, I'm usually, you know, over seeing a lot of the messages and things that come in. Um, but yeah, Twitter, Twitter, or Facebook tends to be again. Carl Hudson on Facebook tends to be the the core elements. I am trying to get more into LinkedIn. Um, I've just yeah. I I feel like it's always really <clears throat> spammy when you go on there. But my problem is I've got a long, long time ago. You used to be able to mass invite. Oh yeah, I used to do that. Um, so I've got about. I think fucking 10,000 contacts. So I get messages off every man and dog. Um, so I just don't like, if I'm being honest, I should probably just delete the full account and start again. <laughs> um, and then because of whether or not there's a LinkedIn algorithm as well, because I don't know, you know, th- there is random mans and dogs of mans probably on my uh, LinkedIn. So 
like if there is an algorithm there, I'm pretty sure LinkedIn's like bloody hell. What this guy knows everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just should probably start again on that to make it more focused on you know our core topic. Yeah, um, yeah. But again, just I always try to get courses. So throughout the year, um, even though a lot of people would consider I'm a high level SEO, I'll still always try and refresh my knowledge um, by doing at least one course a year. Vet like bare minimum, um, and then if I find any good nuggets or elements from that, I often have like a. Um, let's show you on the phone. I've got like a note folder on my phone, which is you know, it's three hundred and seventy notes in there, and they're all in like folders and tables and shit. So like, just often like things that I find that are pretty good, I'll just quickly write a quick iPhone note and then shove it into a folder. Um, and then the important part is to go back and review that folder every so often, though, because sometimes what ends up happening is you just keep putting notes in, but you're never actually actioning what the notes say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like yeah, my strategy moving forward as well. So people can find you on on Twitter because I yeah. feel like you you've you've you went, Sorry, on, I went, off, went off on a tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you went on a, off on a tangent. So people Twitter, can find you on Twitter and searchru dot com as well. Searchru dot com, Twitter, and um, Facebook. Facebook, yeah, right. So that's where you guys can essentially annoy him if you guys have any SEO related questions. Um, and yeah, thanks for jumping on the podcast. Cheers, guys.